Hi everyone, I'm Julie Fleshman, President and CEO of PanCan. I'm so glad to be with all of you today for a conversation about navigating nutrition and pancreatic cancer. Thank you for joining us. Planning for proper nutrition is so important during every part of the pancreatic cancer journey. In fact, good nutrition care improves outcomes and is critical for every patient's quality of life. PanCan recommends that all patients have access to pancreatic enzymes and see a registered dietitian. Hopefully you've seen the great information on our website about diet and nutrition. We have a lot of helpful tips and guidance for patients and caregivers. This includes information for common nutritional challenges like controlling weight loss and coping with loss of appetite. Browse recipes, find tips for ingredient substitutions and more all on our website. Today, we're talking about a range of topics, including enzymes, meal planning, and working with a dietitian. We'll also hear about new research developments and learn more about how PanCam Patient Services supports patients and families when it comes to nutrition. There will be a lot of information provided today, so if you have any questions or need personalized support, PanCam Patient Services is available to you via phone and email Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific time. This free service connects you to an expert case manager who can answer all of your questions. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our webinar sponsor, Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. I'd also like to thank our scientific and medical affairs industry members, AstraZeneca, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Fibrogen, Ipsen, Marathi Therapeutics, Novartis, and Novacure. And finally, a special thank you to all our donors who have joined today. Your giving directly supports all of PanCan's vital work to support patients and families. So today, I'm excited to introduce you to four special guests. Janine Mills is a clinical oncology dietitian at Dartmouth Cancer Center and a PanCan Scientific and Medical Advisory Board member. Dr. Teresa Zimmers is a professor at Knight Cancer Institute at Oregon Health and Science University. George Johnson is a PanCam Patient Services Manager. He speaks with patients with pancreatic cancer and their caregivers every day, answering questions about the disease, treatment, diet and nutrition, and living with pancreatic cancer. And finally, we have Nick Pafani with us today. He is a pancreatic cancer survivor and he serves in several important leadership roles for PanCan as our Survivor Council co-chair and co-affiliate chair in Philadelphia. Nick will share his story and discuss what he has learned about nutrition through his own diagnosis, treatment, and survivorship. Thank you all for being here. Let's get started. Janine, let's start with you and cover some of the basics. What is a registered dietitian and why is this person an important member of the care team for patients with pancreatic cancer? Sure. So a registered dietitian has to have um, a bare minimum of a master's or a graduate level degree. This is new as of 2024. Um, and to sit for the register, to sit for the registration exam to become an RD. And before that happens, they also do an internship of nine months or so, um, of which we have to apply for. There is a designation of RD, a registered dietitian. There's also a registered dietitian nutritionist. Um, and we might be licensed depending on the state that we're in. And there may also be something, um, you know, you'll see additional certifications like a CSO, and that designates a specialty in oncology nutrition. And that's something that requires an examination as well, as well as, you know, 2000 hours or so of experience in clinical oncology. And as a dietitian, what do you do for patients? Great. Um, yeah. So in particular with pancreatic cancer, I see patients at diagnosis. I feel pretty fortunate to do that. I feel that the earliest th that we can intervene, the better. Um, many of our patients come to us with a compromise and an ability to eat. There can be weight loss. There can be pain. There can be nausea, alter alteration in their bowels, um, which which brings me to mind of a new patient that I had this past week whose normal weight was about 100 pounds and she'd lost to about 77. She was newly diagnosed with pancreatic cancer 
increased pain, increased pain with eating. Um, so it was a wonderful, um, because of how our team is set up, we see new patients together. So um, medical oncology, surgery, and social work, um, it was just this wonderful collaborative approach. Um, I worked with her in terms of a lot of troubleshooting with these patients because they're getting inundated with so many providers at that first visit that I'm really just troubleshooting with the big, big issues for that patient. And for her, that was starting her on pancreatic enzymes, working with specialty pharmacy because her out of pocket costs were tremendous. Um, so I felt like, um, so I feel like day to day, that's probably the, one of the most wonderful things that I can do is that collaboration with the team. Um, you really feel like you've made a difference for that patient and that patient left with a lot of hope. Um, you know, that I, the intervening as soon as possible, you know, seeing these patients as soon as they're diagnosed, so important because if we're able to troubleshoot and and help them with a lot of these symptoms that are presenting from their disease um, and they're able to then maintain their weight this is a woman who's about to embark on treatment on a course of chemotherapy so if we're able to maintain her weight certainly she's going to be able to tolerate treatment so much better um she's her recovery is going to be improved her quality of life better so um that's one of the things, of many of the things that we do in the clinic, um, but in terms of our pancreatic cancer patients, seeing them early on is really important. Such important work. And of course, PanCan highly recommends that every pancreatic cancer patient see a registered dietitian. So can you describe what a patient might expect on their first appointment with a dietitian and how should they prepare for that appointment? Sure. So I, I ha comes to mind another patient that I've had more recently um, who was petrified to see me. <laughs> so here you have a patient who's already met with a surgeon, has met with a medical oncologist who's going to deliver the treatment. And he was so he was really afraid, um, you know, he was very fearful. And, and, and as soon as I came into the clinic room, um, you know, it looked like he just wanted to bolt. Um, he was accompanied by his wife, um, but for him, I think um, the impression was that I was going to certainly hand him a diet. And um, at that point, um, he's really compromised in his ability to eat. Um, he has newly diagnosed diabetes on top of a new pancreatic cancer. His blood sugars over the past two to three months have been really quite high, you know, not normal for him. And so he had done a lot of research on the web and found out, um, eliminated quite a few uh, foods from his diet. I won't go into too much detail, but it was, um, you know, sharing what he was doing. He was shared with resources where he went on the web. Um, and it was just really helpful to be able to clarify for a lot of these patients um, how the diet might change. And, and it's not so much, it's not telling patients what will take away from their diet. I think they're so afraid of that. It's more about what can we add to the diet to really support them while they're on treatment. Um, you know, with diabetes too, that's a common phenomenon, right? We see a lot of patients with newly diagnosed pancreatic cancer with an existing diabetes or new diabetes, and it invokes a lot of fear around eating. Um, they may also have pain with eating or discomfort or cramping, bloating, discomfort, and afraid to eat, you know, are certain foods going to make that much worse? So it's really, you can see the relief in his face when you start to talk about, hey, no, we can branch out. You know, we need to really support your weight, weight right now. Um, so I would encourage patients to bring those questions with them, to be able to talk about some of the resources that they've encountered, sharing some of the resources that I have through PanCan. We we give out the um, booklet that PanCan produces as the nutrition for the patient with pancreatic cancer, and it's absolutely wonderful resource book for patients. Um, it's the one book I give. I'm not usually a fan of books, but that's one that one is really wonderful. Um, but it's also talking to patients how we might modify the diet depending on symptoms. Um, always encourage caregivers to come along 
Um, they, they really provide a lot of insight to what's happening at home. And it's really interesting to talk to patients and to try to understand how they're ch challenged by some of the, si um, the symptoms that they're experiencing that are that's maybe getting in the way of eating and um, the caregiver can add to that. Um, and also just understanding from a caregiver's um, perspective how challenging it can be for them to support patients when the appetite's really low, you know, how preferences can change from one day to the next even, right? Or favorite foods are no longer their favorite and some of the frustration that caregivers have. So it's in a way, I feel like it's nice to be able to support them too. Such important information. I mean, eating together is how we socialize. It's how we spend time with our family and our friends. And so being able to continue to do that when you have a diagnosis like this is just so critically important. So patients who have gone through a major surgery like the Whipple procedure often have very specific nutritional needs. What should patients be thinking about after surgery? Yes. So, and then and another hat that I wear, I follow um, surgical patients, um, pancreatic surgery, surgical patients fairly closely. And um, this occurred probably back some, some years ago when I found out the general surgeons, the oncology surgeons were very interested in having involvement of nutrition to follow up with these patients after Whipple. And so, um, but more recently, um, what I found has really been helpful is also taking the approach of talking with patients even before their surgery, whether it's a Whipple, whether it's a distal pancreatectomy or a total pancreatectomy to sort of let them understand how the anatomy will be different after a surgery like, a, you know, like a Whipple. Um, and it's really, if you look at a lot of the literature now that's out there, there's a, a lot more um, excitement and enthusiasm about centers embracing sort of this prehab thought of seeing and talking patients about improving their nutrition, getting them moving before their surgery. And so I've been doing more of that and it's really enlightening to see how much patients really favor that approach of getting stronger for surgery. We know that malnutrition or being malnourished before surgery really um, worsens outcomes for patients. We know it increases the risk of complications by threefold. Um, so aside from just seeing patients after surgery and what they can expect is um, there can be changes in eating. Usually I'm calling patients within five days of them being home from their surgeries um, and they can experience a flip-flop in their bowels from being, you know, loose to constipated. Um, if they're, if they haven't been on pancreatic enzymes before their surgery, they're certainly out on them after something like a Whipple surgery. So that's a whole learning curve too in dosing those enzymes. And maybe they're eating much smaller volume. Their anatomy is different, and there can be almost an asynchrony of digestion for these patients. Um, there can be a delay in gastric emptying. So we work very hard in finding and resolving these problems for these patients, especially within the first two to four weeks home. Um, sometimes we're looking at medications that can help that delayed gastric emptying so that they feel better when they eat and they don't feel so full. Um, sometimes there's a lower appetite overall, lower motivation to eat and drive to eat following these big surgeries. So it's nice to be so involved and, and calling them and trying to see them at their first post-op visit. Um, I'd also say that we're very interested in micronutri micronutrient deficiency, especially after Whipple resections. And so um, at six months, um, we've been doing a micro, micronutrient um, surveillance where we actually look at blood levels of fat soluble vitamins, vitamins A, D and E, as well as some of the B vitamins, an iron panel or a serum ferritin to evaluate for iron deficiency, which I'm seeing is more prevalent in our patients after, after Whipple. So it's also repleting those if we're finding deficiencies um, and then looking at these same nutri nutrient deficiencies um, on an annual basis. Great. And, and of course, all patients don't have surgery, but chemotherapy also 
create side effects that impact appetite. What is some gem- general advice for patients in, the, in that phase of their journey? Yeah, sure. And it's always, um, you know, it's always wonderful to meet that patient, like I described earlier, who was so symptomatic upon her diagnosis with pain and um, pancreatic insufficiency. Um, And that same patient who started treatment, they started to respond to their treatment, they started to feel better. Um, But then they may have this whole new subset of side effects from their chemotherapy that may compromise their eating. Um, For this patient in particular, we had to increase her pancreatic enzymes. She did start to have more diarrhea associated with her chemotherapy, so we've had to adjust some of the foods that she ate, maybe lower fiber to help in terms of managing her bowels, adding Imodium or Lamotil to help slow down the bowels. But she also has found that there are lower days of eating, and some patients will see that in a cycle of chemotherapy like Fulfurinox, you know, the day that they they disconnect from their their chemotherapy pump might be the lowest day for them. You know, they might feel like, geez, you know, I really can't even find what I want to eat. I feel very fatigued. So we help in that regard in finding sort of those go-to foods on the lower days, or maybe it's simply just staying up with their hydration. Um, taste changes, you know, they become, they be, can become really challenging for our patients. Um, for this patient in particular, it was a challenge where there was more um, of a sense that sweet was too sweet or salt was too salty. So she was really having a hard time finding foods that work and talking with her and being creative to find solutions that could help. Um, whether it's just oral care or finding medications that are contributing more to her dry mouth um, and working with her to 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 help modify that. Um, I was trying to think about some of the things that other things that she's gone through more recently. Um, and then of course, there's um, patients even on presentation can feel that they need to, consume smaller meals. And a lot of times that doesn't change when they're on chemotherapy too. And I think that there can be this preference change like we were talking about earlier where their favorite foods become less favorite and it's all about finding new foods that work. Um, Again, this patient is actually maintaining weight and responding to her treatment, her tumor markers coming, her tumor markers coming down and We've been working really hard to um, help her with the diarrhea that she's having. Um, She's a bus monitor, (laughs) so we want to be able to help her in her quality of life. She really enjoys doing that. So the more that we can refine our approach working as a team (laughs) and helping her with her symptoms, the even the better. And thank you so much for sharing these real life examples. I think it helps patients and caregivers see themselves in the stories that you're telling. So thank you. This was just a terrific overview. And I'm going to come back to you with some more questions. But now let's turn to Dr. Teresa Zimmers, who is going to talk to us a little about about research. So Teresa, it's great to see you. I'd like to talk to you about a challenge familiar, familiar to many people facing pancreatic cancer, and that's cachexia. You, your work focuses on on this debilitating condition. Can you talk what is cachexia, when and how does it affect patients facing pancreatic cancer, and what are some of the ways to manage this condition? Yeah, thank you for those questions. I think Janine gave us a really great overview of many of the different aspects of cachexia, which some people call malnutrition. So clinically, cachexia is defined as unintentional weight loss that's caused by the cancer. In research, we tend to follow muscle mass, so we can measure patients' muscle mass in a variety of ways, including their diagnostic CT scans. And we know that retaining muscle mass and function associates to better um, response to therapy, um, reduced um, adverse events, and increased survival in patients. So um, for patients, cachexia is that feeling of um, not wanting to eat, Um, desire not to move about very much, um, weakness, declining strength, and watching sort of that progressive weight loss um, in the mirror on the scale. And it means that patients can't do the things they necessarily used to do with such enjoyment, like sports or picking up children or gardening or that sort of thing. 
I think it's really important to understand why this happens because in pancreatic cancer, there are lots of factors that can cause a reduction in food intake or the ability to digest because it is a digestive organ. But it's important to know that the cancer is actually activating a program of uh, what's normally protective, an injury response. So back in evolutionary times, if you were bitten by a saber-toothed tiger or you ate the wrong mushroom and you injured your liver, it was important that you sort of remove yourself from your daily activities. And so your immune system evolved to tell your brain that you're not hungry and that you're feeling weak. So you crawl away to your cave. And then because you're not eating, your body would use the stores it already has. So it activate a program where you break down fat and muscle so that you could restore that injured liver or that injured tissue or clear the infection. And then you could get up and go about and restore that body mass by eating, hunting and gathering. Of course, you know, in cancer, um, it's a wound that doesn't heal, an infection that doesn't clear. So this adaptive program that we evolved to protect ourselves actually becomes um, pathological in itself. And so um, we're trying to understand that. Um, and the processes that underlie that. We know that for pancreatic cancer and for other serious cancers, weight loss is often the first symptom of cancer and often what drives people to go see the doctor, as Janine talked about her patient earlier. About 70% of people with pancreatic cancer present with weight loss or cachexia, and about 85% of that will, will experience it um, across their cancer um, journey. Um, you know, addressing this is really important. Um, we know that retaining weight and retaining muscle associates to better outcomes. And while right now um, there is no targeted therapy, you know, we're actively seeking to understand those mechanisms so we can develop better treatments, there are um, various strategies that patients can take, um, including those that Janine um, described. Um, what, you know, it's important to try to eat well and to stay active. And it sounds very easy, but as we heard, that's very difficult to do. So you're Cancer is telling the brain you're not hungry, and this can become a, a bone of contention, you know, among families. So I think it's important to understand that that's just part of the whole um, cancer disease process. So I think working really hard with your team and leaning into wonderful people um, like Janine is really important to get the best supportive care. There's obviously things you've heard about to um, increase digestion, to increase appetite, and reduce feelings of nausea and vomiting. And getting help from social workers or um, psychologists to address distress, you know, depression, other things that might be keeping people from eating and moving about normally. And importantly, I think seeking guidance from a physical therapist to get a recommended program of exercise, um, because eating and moving, I think, are the best things that we know right now to address cachexia. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's such an important area of research and not enough research, I think, happening in this area. You're one of the people that we're so proud to partner with um, to better understand cachexia, diet and nutrition, and, and how to ensure that patients have better quality of life. So when you think about the current research that's related to cachexia, what are you most excited about? What's on the horizon for patients? Well, I'm most excited because, as you say, cachexia is finally moving from kind of a sideline where a very small handful of people are interested in this, you know, more into the mainstream of cancer research, in no small part due to efforts like, of organizations like PANCAN and PANCAN in particular. Um, so more people are coming to the field, more bright young minds are attracted towards this question. We're finally, I think, going to be able to leverage all the incredible power of cancer research that's been directed against tumors to address what's happening to patients. And so I think cachexia is one of those fields where um, we begin to think about what's happening in the whole person, not just how to kill the tumor. From the research perspective, it's exciting because there's more and more known about the molecular mechanisms, you know, the specific molecules that communicate between the tumor and the body that cause cachexia. And we have the largest number of interventional clinical trials ever in cachexia. Um, including some that are targeted therapies. You know, that is just a sliver even of all the interventional trials that have ever been done in pancreatic cancer. So we're at the very beginning of things. And I think as a field, we acknowledge that any therapy will be multimodal. It'll probably involve some anti-inflammatory component, an appetite stimulant, 
and an anabolic stimulant to help build muscle, including um, with nutritional approaches, um, nutritional supplements perhaps, and an exercise program. But I'm extremely optimistic. I think we're at the very beginning of a transformational, exponential growth in our understanding of cachexia, and I'm very hopeful that this will yield um, you know, benefit for patients in the very near term. Well, that's great to hear. Um, As you can imagine, we hear a lot from people with pancreatic cancer about whether there's a relationship between what we eat and how the cancer grows. People are concerned, what should I do? I want to, you know, ensure the cancer doesn't keep growing. Can you talk more about this? What does the research show? So I think there are a number of really interesting preclinical studies, meaning studies in mouse models or in cell cultures where an extreme change in diet might have a very profound effect on the tumor growth, tumor response to therapy, or cancer cell growth. I'm not aware of any compelling data in people, and people with pancreatic cancer in particular, that a radical change in the diet is going to change a tumor response to therapy or tumor growth. And you know, um, I find it difficult to limit, you know, carbs and sugar intake in the best of times. And I can't imagine how difficult that would be for someone undergoing treatment for cancer. Um, so as Janine said, you know, I think the very best thing is to tap into wonderful resources like um, Janine and, and her team and PanCan and the resources there to, you know, um, provide yourself with the very best diet possible to get through this treatment. You know, I've spoken to many of my really wonderful oncologist colleagues who have deep knowledge and understanding of cachexia about this, and the message is invariably the same. You know, try to eat well, and to do that, eat what you enjoy, um, and then try to use that energy deliberately to move your body and keep your strength. Great, great advice, and I'm sure a relief for people to hear that, that, that you know, eating is the most important thing to keep them going through through this, this journey. So thank you, Teresa. Um, let's bring the pancreatic cancer survivor perspective into our conversation. Nick, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It would be great to hear more about your story. When were you diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and how did your treatment progress? Sure. Thanks for having me, Julie. So believe it or not, seven years ago today, um, I uh, found out I had pancreatic cancer. Um, You know, I would tell you that I had the classic symptoms, which I was unaware of. Um, And when I started experiencing those back in March of 2017, I called the family doctor probably a couple couple months before that. And uh, they recommended that I see a GI specialist, um, but the symptoms got worse. Um, And uh, I found myself in the emergency room. And within a couple of hours, I found out I had a mass on my pancreas. And then, you know, a couple of days later, confirmed after I saw, you know, oncologists that specialize with pancreas cancer. Um, What I can tell you is that I was diagnosed stage three, locally advanced and operable. You know, so for me, surgery was not an option from the beginning. Um, So I did, I was fortunate enough where I had amazing medical care, uh, genetic testing to start things from right from the get go, which, you know, uh, informed my care because I did have a genetic mutation. Um, I started with chemotherapy, um, specifically with fulfurinox, which is a platinum based chemo. And I was able to tolerate about six sessions uh, of that. And then when my body stopped recovering, perhaps as quickly as the doctors would like, they changed me over to five and a half weeks of targeted radiation treatment, um, which I tolerated uh, quite well. Great. Well, thank you. First of all, happy seventh year survivorship anniversary. That's amazing, and um, always something that you're you're inspiring everyone who who is watching today. So thank you. You also brought us some ever other important points that PanCan recommends that all pancreatic cancer patients get genetic and biomarker testing when they're diagnosed to find the very best treatment for the particular um, individual. And it sounds like you did just that, and we're so glad to hear that. So can you talk about some of the nutrition, uh, the approaches that you've taken throughout your fa- the phases of your journey with this illness, and what are some of the things that you've learned about diet and nutrition? 
Well, I think the first thing that I learned was when I started chemotherapy that, you know, I just tried to eat what I could. Um, so that was the advice I kind of followed. Um, you know, I found probably for about four weeks, all I really wanted was pizza. So <laughs> no, it probably wasn't the best of things, but you know, the goal was to try to keep the weight on, um, while I was uh, going through treatment. Um, I did evolve as, uh, time went along, you know, trying to maintain a, a well-balanced diet. Uh, I'm a runner. By trade, I ran all through chemo and rode my bike all through chemo and radiation. So for me, um, I would tell you that, um, you know, keeping your energy level up is critical and you can tell really quickly when your nutrition is failing and that's when you feel lethargic. Um, things changed for me quite a bit when I had the Whipple procedure. Um, when I had the Whipple, I recovered quite well, was out in five days believe it or not, was running in about seven weeks. Um, but what I learned really quickly when I got home was I called the doctors and the nurses and said, you know, I don't feel right. I'm really tired and really lethargic. And I met with one of the um, nutritionists at that time. And she said, well, what are you eating? And I just explained it to her. And the best advice that she gave me was, you need to write it down. Keep a journal. Let's see what works for you. Um, and she had given me some advice, which was really good, which was, uh, she didn't think I was getting enough protein in my diet. Um, so I worked on upping the protein, kind of keeping the meals small and, uh, you know, it worked quite well for me. Energy levels returned. Um, I would tell you that, um, I did find out one thing as I kind of evolved through after surgery and that was, I kept getting lots of stomach distress and pain, um, specifically when I ate meat. So I figured that out through the journaling and I experimented with the diet and essentially removed eating all meat. Ironically, my pain went down by about 95 to 95%. And, um, you know, moving forward, you know, I don't eat meat anymore. I would tell you that every single person is different. I know a lot of pancreatic cancer survivors that will have a steak for dinner. Uh, for me, um, that's just doesn't work quite well for me. Um, but I will tell you that, you know, I eat lots, I eat a pretty well balanced diet, lots of seafood, lots of vegetables, lots of eggs. Um, so it works quite well for me. And, you know, now being out six plus years from the Whipple procedure, I feel like I've got a, a pretty good grasp you know, on, uh, on the diet. No, that's great. And I saw Janine nodding at a lot of things you were saying around the journaling and tracking what you're eating and that every patient is different. So I think you just made a, a bunch of great points there, Nick. Um, as a member of Pan Cancer Survivor Council, you often talk to people facing pancreatic cancer to provide support and reassurance. What is one piece of advice you give on the topic of nutrition? I give them the advice that I got, and that was keep a journal and write, write things down. Um, I also tell them that don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, sometimes you think you understand, you know, you think you have a good grasp of what you're, you're consuming and how you're feeling. And, uh, you know, I just mentioned that I was one of those people. I felt like I had a really good grasp on it. And what I quickly figured out was I really did. not And, um, you know, once I got some help, things improve dramatically. So again, keeping that journal and then making sure that you reach out for the right type of help. Great, thank you, Nick, such great advice. Really appreciate it. Janine, do you have any thoughts about keeping a journal? Might wanna make any comments about that? That's one thing I forgot to add when when you asked me about, you know, being prepared um, when, you want, when you meet that dietitian for the first time, that food log, food diary, whatever you want to call it, is so revealing. You know, even going, like Nick is mentioning, you know, going through it and finding sometimes there is a problem food, even with the best use of pancreatic enzymes. Um, sometimes we just don't um, hit, we may even hit the limit for, for how many enzymes a patient may be taking at a meal, but they still have an intolerance to higher fat foods you know, for instance. 
Um, so they they quickly begin to realize those foods that are, you know, hey, I, maybe I'll return to them sometime, but maybe not now. Yeah, no, that's great. Janine, let's talk a little bit about meal planning. Um, are there any tips on balancing new dietary needs while continuing to make space for those things that are important and enjoyable? Yeah, so that's that's a great question. Um, I do get caregivers um, who are sort of managing the diet or or cooking for food or cooking foods at home for for patients and. Um, frequently we'll get this question and, you know, maybe this is a patient that just started cycle one of fulfurinox and that caregiver might say, hey, you know, can you create a five day menu for my my husband? And um, I very gently will say, I, I don't think I can do that. <laughs> Mostly because, um, you know, preferences for foods can change on treatment. I don't know if that happened with Nick or not, but Food preferences can change, tastes can change. Um, there can be um, symptoms from treatment that drive um, food preferences as well. Like we were talking about earlier when there are low days and increased fatigue, food choices are quite different. Um, so I really try to talk more about, you know, like we were talking about earlier, what can we add to the diet to really um um, support you, but also that food gives a lot of pleasure. So I often have patients will say, Hey, is ice cream? Okay. And it's, you know, ice cream is like one of my favorite foods. Um, sure. There's a, there is definitely a space for ice cream. Um, because you know, they, they do, you know, when they talk with you, they think you are, um, you know, your diet is just nothing but fruits and vegetables and lean meats and on a good day. Yeah, sure. But there's also just that pleasure of eating. And you shouldn't have guilt about that. Like I said, I think diet um, is a four letter word for some people and, and just connotates sort of that restriction. And we really want so much more to cater to food preferences. Like Nick said, pizza worked. And, you know, some other patient may have brought to my attention that said, hey, I, I heard I shouldn't be eating these foods. And, you know, I never say never. I might advise caution on some foods, depending on what symptoms they're having. Um, but I never, you know, draw an X into any food. Unless you know, it's a problem for them, they'll, they'll draw an X through it. But, yeah. That's great. Well, one of the words that you've used a lot, and we get a lot of questions at PanCan about pancreatic enzymes. Um, so what advice, let's talk a little bit, what advice would you give about pancreatic enzymes? How do you help patients determine important things like when to take enzymes and how much? Yes, um, that is a topic of conversation <laughs> for sure. Um, I think I talked about enzymes at least five times today to different patients. So um, I think for me, probably the biggest advice would be dosing. And I feel that a lot of patients are started on pancreatic enzymes for pancreatic insufficiency. So pancreatic insufficiency would be the signs and symptoms would be bloating, discomfort with eating, um, loose stools that can often be masked by narcotics, you know, slowing those stools down. Um, so maybe not always the issue. Um, much lighter color, colored stool, malodorous gas. Sometimes I'll joke with my patients and say, you know, gas that drives the dog out of the room kind of thing. Um, so we get very interested in bowels <laughs> and have that conversation freely with our patients. Um, but so I think part of the issue too, is we start patients on pancreatic enzymes at diagnosis, where we're, we're, um, all of those patients that we see newly new diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, we're really assessing for signs and symptoms of pancreatic insufficiency. I mean, that's top on the list. And every time I meet my patients throughout their treatment course, I'm assessing for that need. Um, I feel like, again, back to the biggest, uh, the, the word adv advice, which I'm, I'm sorry, I need to get right to that point, is that Patients aren't always told to dose up. So I have patients that are taking, um, you know, maybe two with a meal, one with a snack, and maybe that's our starting dose. 
but they're never always told to dose up or they're afraid to. Maybe the team has advised dosing up because they have persistent signs and symptoms of pancreatic insufficiency. Um, and so they're afraid to dose up. But when you talk to them about, hey, you know, you still have these signs and symptoms of pancreatic insufficiency, it's okay to dose up and you can remedy that. Or if I can tell them, hey, I have patients who start at two with a meal, but guess what? They've graduated to taking five or six or even seven with a meal and one to two with a snack. So I think it's that information of dosing, you know, taking them at the first bite of a meal, taking, taking if you're taking more than one or two or more than two with a meal, taking them while you're eating throughout the meal, right? If you forget to eat, you uh, forget to take them, you're human. <laughs> it happens all the time. Um, dosing them with snacks, dosing them with um, a nutritional drink. Of course, you're probably going to want to take them with, um, you know, something like um, a higher calorie shake that you've made for yourself. You know, don't forget to take um, an enzyme with that. So, um, and there is, I think, too, the, the second big thing that I would say is, is there are often, um, for instance, the patient I was telling you about earlier, you know, we prescribed pancreatic enzymes for her. Um, she called me from her cell phone in her car to say, Janine, they're $2,000 out of pocket. And I get that call all the time. I work hard with specialty pharmacy because we look into manufacturer assistance. Um, there's other resources um, like the GoodRx that we might look at too. But oftentimes we're applying, helping patients apply for assistance through some of the the companies that make the enzymes. That can be really tough on our patients, you know, because maybe the game changer is the taking the enzymes. They've made a huge impact on their quality of life. And now that they're finding that they're, you know, astronomically expensive for them. So there's a lot of shuffling to try to get them samples or um, coupons that we can get through manufacturers to alleviate that. Thank you so much for bringing up that important issue because I do know that financial barrier, um, you know, is obviously important to patients, and that's another area where patient services can can help patients to to negotiate that. So thank you so much, Janine. Just amazing, wonderful information. So George, it's a great segue over to you. Thousands of people call patient PanCan's patient services every year with questions about diet and nutrition. So can you talk a little bit more about what are some of the common concerns that you and the other case managers help to address. Certainly, and and thank you for inviting me, Julie, to be a part of this superb panel. Um, our our PanCan patient services case managers are are very dedicated to assisting pancreatic cancer patients and their loved ones with, uh, with any questions they might have. Um, serving as a source of educational information and resources, including um, guidance on diet and nutrition, like you said, um, it was really exciting to hear the answers from some of the other pa from the panelists earlier that address many of the common questions that we get. Um, I think that stresses even more the importance of bringing these questions to specialists and professionals. So, um, some of those frequent questions we receive include um, questions about recommended dietary modifications um, tailored specifically to pancreatic cancer patients at any point in their cancer journey, um, and especially before and after treatment. For example, um, what dietary changes should be made following surgery? Or um, a second common question would be, um, we've discussed already what the importance of pancreatic enzyme products are now that I've been diagnosed. Um, also, we receive many questions on symptoms and side effect management and how changes to diet can potentially improve or complicate these symptoms and side effects. Um, for example, some patients may experience a metallic taste with their meals if they're sensitive to certain chemotherapies, and they'll ask how to improve the taste of their food or how to avoid this potential side effect. Um, planning out meals is another common concern that we've talked about again. What foods will potentially cause discomfort should I avoid to get through the day? Or how can I maximize caloric intake throughout each day? And, and many, many more questions. So um, our team does our best to address these questions. But it's important to note that we are not medical or nutritional professionals. Therefore, we cannot provide medical or nutritional advice and recommendations. Um, instead, we provide, again, information, resources. And we also have a wonderful um, diet nutrition booklet that was brought up earlier that we encourage patients to bring back to their healthcare teams. And hopefully, a registered dietitian who's a part of that healthcare 
healthcare team. And um, as we've discussed, this registered dietitian can personalize a diet plan a bit more to the patient specific needs, um, like incorporating the foods that we love and that are important to our diverse cultural backgrounds, as well as our unique nutritional preferences, um, while maintaining often those new adjusted nutritional goals. Um, and the registered dietitian is another place where patient services can be of help. We can connect um, patients with registered dietitians if they don't have a preferred one already um, that have experience with gastrointestinal cancers, including pancreatic cancer. So, so please reach out to PanCan Patient Services with, with any questions via our website, on our social media, or by phone. Uh, we are available Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and are always very happy to assist. Great. Thank you so much, George. So I know you have a story to share about a patient and how we were able to help them with questions related to nutrition. Would love to hear about your experience with this person and how PanCan's patient services was able to make a difference. Yes, and it's, it's my pleasure to share. Um, there's this, this lovely individual that um, I have kept in touch with since I first started with PanCan back in 2020. And her, her mother was diagnosed with adenocarcinoma and had the Whipple procedure. Um, she, and, she and her mother had many questions about meal planning around a specific condition that was the result of um, the Whipple procedure, unfortunately. Um, and that condition was gastroparesis, uh, which is when the stomach is temporarily paralyzed and cannot properly empty itself of food by, by normal mechanisms, the usual mechanisms. So uh, for this condition, the, the patient had to switch to tube feeding and started um, a strict enteral diet, which is tube feeding artificial nutrition provided directly via tube to the stomach or intestines. Um, eventually, the patient had to switch completely entirely over to parenteral feeding, which is nutrition provided directly into the vein or bloodstream. So a very complicated and difficult situation. Um, I hope Help send different uh, relevant resources and research information on how to maintain weight. Um, research different enteral and parenteral diet formulas that this individual and her mother would discuss would, would discuss with the registered dietitian. Um, they eventually agreed on a specific formula that met the um, the mother's nutritional needs. However, these formulas um, and total parenteral nutrition in general can be quite expensive. So. Um, uh, as we were talking about those financial barriers, I, I helped connect um, the patient with our PanCan Financial Navigation Program in partnership with the Patient Advocate Foundation, where um, they were able to help with the financial assistance necessary to sustain the cost of the parenteral nutrition, which was a, a huge relief for the family. Um, and, and as is the case with, with this individual and her mother, it, it's always an honor when PanCan Patient Services can assist patients and their loved ones in, in any way, big or small, and we look forward to connecting with um, anyone who has questions about diet and nutrition. Thank you, George. It was a wonderful example. And another example that we hadn't discussed yet on the on the call about um, how diet and nutrition impacts um, pancreatic cancer patients in so many different ways. So thank you to this amazing panel. Um, just a great um, array of perspectives and amazing advice for, for patients and families who are listening in today. So thank you all. It's been so great to have you with us. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for taking the time to join us today. And thank you to all of you out there watching. Find more information on all of the topics we discussed today on PanCan's website at pancan.org backslash diet and nutrition. You can also explore recipes created with the nutritional needs of pancreatic cancer patients in mind. Take a look and try one out. And of course, for any questions, contact PanCan Patient Services to speak with one of our highly trained and informed case managers. Case managers are ready to take your calls and emails Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific time. PanCan is able to provide these free services to the public because of the generous support of people like you. Join us in the fight against pancreatic cancer and register for PanCan Purple Stride, the walk to end pancreatic cancer happening across the country on April 27th. It's our biggest fundraising event of the year and we would love to see you there. Visit purplestride.org to get started. A recording of this webinar will be available if you are interested in rewatching or sharing with your friends and family. Thank you all so much for joining us today. <music>